Hello and welcome to the podcast, The Way of the Sensitive. I'm your host, Cara Weld. This is a podcast for those of us who feel called to live in a different way, to create a new society where diversity and uniqueness is celebrated, not shamed. We're the channels of the light, co-creating a heaven on earth upon this beautiful planet. We're here to live and achieve our soul's goals in this lifetime. To us, it's not woo, it's real. Call in all the magic makers, the mystics, the empaths, the sensitives, the starseeds, the artistic, autistic ones, sometimes sidelined, sometimes scapegoated, but we know that we're here to create new pathways in the one mind, because it's not just about traversing alternative dimensions, it's also about landing and being fully alive in this gorgeous world. This week, we are talking to Sandra Kornblatt of RestfulInsomnia.com. And Sandra helps people grappling with insomnia and exhaustion who want to finally feel rested enough to know and go after their dreams. And this conversation was really interesting for those of you who struggle with sleep, whether that's intermittently, you know, frustrated with the 2 a.m. thoughts that, you know, anxiety thoughts that keep us awake or whether you struggle to go off to sleep in the first place, whether you struggle to feel truly rested in your sleep and, you know, that elusive waking up feeling refreshed. Um, Whatever your relationship is with sleep, if it's not working for you for some reason, I think you're going to find this episode really useful. Sandra I've known for a few months now through a business group that we're both in and she has really revolutionized my idea of sleep, of what it is, completely reframed it. That was my biggest takeaway, my biggest aha moment from interviewing Sandra was that she sees rest as a journey. Oh, no, sorry, let me say that again. She sees sleep as a process rather than sleep as something to get. Oh my God, when I was thinking about how I relate to sleep and it is about, it, sleep is something to get. It's it's almost become something to do on my to-do list, you know, get my eight hours sleep or my seven hours sleep or whatever it is so that I can get on with the day. And even when I still enjoy my sleep and I still look forward to rest, it's it's something to get and seeing sleep as a process and seeing deep sleep and deep rest as a process really changed my approach and we talk about this in a lot more detail we talk about how to have a relationship with our minds that is more conducive to rest we talk about the managing the anxiety at 2 a.m or anxious thoughts before you're going off to sleep and really quite creative ways of how you can do this, ways that I haven't thought of. And if you've got children, I specifically talked to Sandra about um, one of my children that suffers, well, doesn't suffer, but finds going off to sleep really quite challenging. It's like a brain just doesn't switch off. And we talked about that quite a lot. And like how to get out of feeling, feeling stuck in the loop between not getting enough sleep so therefore not feeling like you're effective in your day and because you're not getting stuff done that you want to get done during the day or you're not enjoying your day then that affects your sleep as well and that can become like a vicious circle so how to bring fun back into sleep and then really interestingly the link between living lives that are inauthentic for us or that aren't satisfying for us and not being able to sleep or rest that was really really interesting so if you're one of the listeners that struggle with sleep or want to know how to enjoy your sleep more this episode is for you come on over to the facebook group currently that is love notes from the road you know one of these days i'm gonna land on a name for a facebook group that i like but i've opened up a free facebook group for those of us that want to dive more deeply into the channel messages from the a's and to talk about podcast episodes in a deeper manner so i'll put the link to the show notes pop over to the facebook group and i'll invite sandra to join us if there's any questions or any ahas i'd love to hear your biggest takeaway from this podcast episode and hope you enjoy Hello everybody and welcome to episode 26 of the way of the sensitive and today i have managed to bag sandra Kornblatt from Restful Insomnia. Welcome to the show. 
I'm happy to be here. It's lovely to talk to you. So for those listening, I have known Sandra through an online community for a few months, really, I think. Not that long. Uh, Well, whatever you say, I'll agree with. (laughs) (laughs) I I thought it was about, about a year, maybe, but I don't know. No, no, in my memory, you're probably right, and I'll be wrong. Um, but I've got to know Sandra's work quite a lot and her perspective on insomnia and sleep in particular is something that I asked if she'd come on and talk about today. So thank you for that, because I know that you're a life coach, and but I particularly want to speak to you about, um, yeah, sleep issues. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's key. It's key to so many people's mental and emotional and physical health. Yeah. And and so I always start off on the podcast interview with the question of, do you consider yourself a sensitive or a misfit? You know, somebody that kind of doesn't fit into how mainstream society tells us we've got to live. And, you know, those of us that are here to create a different way. Do you see yourself like that? Yes, I do. I mean, I don't know that I identify that way, but as soon as you asked the question, it was like, oh, yes, that's me. So I, um, you know, I, I've never quite felt I'm not cute and perky. So as a female, it just sort of I felt like too much. Um, And I'm also, um, I'm pretty sensitive. I can't read novels, um, because there's plot twists. And if you didn't have a plot twist, it wouldn't be a novel. But you Mm -hmm. know, they just make me way too anxious. So, uh, okay, that makes it. So I've watched. Have you ever seen Everest? Um, the film about the avalanche that happened over there. Have you ever seen the film? No, I've read. I've read uh, the nonfiction book about it, but I haven't seen the film. So the film, I watched it and did what you do with novels. I think I was in bits for the rest of the night, and I woke up at two o'clock in the morning sobbing about what happened to the guy. Yep. So I really get you. So what do you think is like? How do you see that as a strength or a positive as well then? Um, You know, it tunes me into what's going on for people. Um, Sometimes it's a little too much tuning in, um, you know, sort of projecting and having my stuff there. But I think that I I feel like people feel like I really get who they are, Um, you know, through body language, through voice, through, you know, lots of pieces. I, um, I can help them. I help know, I know what's going on underneath often. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so, like, your energy, I've noticed this about you and I'm noticing it now. I want, I'd want. i love to for you to tell the story um, about how you came to restful insomnia. And, um, and I'm just noticing that when I do interviews, I'm like, my nervous system is like, yeah! and go and party and all that kind of stuff but you're really calming <laughs> really like it. it's like grounding so yeah and I think that's part that might be part of your story I don't know but yeah can you tell us a bit about how you came to do what you do yeah you know but it's also interesting to sort of uh, you, you reflecting on me as calm because my kids talk about my anxiety all the time so I think that you know I've been anxious my whole life so I've learned ways to manage it. Um, And some of that happened when I had insomnia. I used to have what was called intermittent insomnia. I'd wake up for when I was anxious, when I had PMS, probably with perimenopause. But about hmm, 16, 18 years ago, um, I started to wake up almost every night in the middle of the night. So after a couple hours, I'd just be bolt awake. I had Mm -hmm. two young kids at the time. And... Mm -hmm. Um, nothing helped. I was just awake. You know, I wasn't anxious. It wasn't hormonal stuff. Um, and it drove me pretty batty. You know, mm. I just, I tried all of the cures. I'm not into medications. I'm sensitive to them. So I tried, you know, melatonin. I tried magnesium. I tried eating uh, turkey for tryptophan before I went to bed. I tried not mm-hmm. eating after eight o'clock. I tried having a glass of wine. I tried having no wine. I tried exercising early in the day. None of it helped. And I was, uh, I was a space case. You know, my kids, um, I was not going to be in the playoffs for mom of the year, clearly. Um, <laughs> not, I was going to be bumped from the team. Um, and I was foggy and cranky. So I was dealing with that for a while, and um, at the same time, I have always been 
one of my deepest values has been personal growth. And it's my value, aside from trying to deal with pain that I was having from parent, you know, from growing up in this world with my parents, I've always valued the process of learning more, more deep um, alignment with who I was. But at that time, I had no time to practice what I learned. So I could go to classes, I could read, I could do stuff. But the only way you really make a difference in who you are is by practicing. So I was actually pushing my daughter in a stroller. And I realized that I had time, but I had time in the middle of the night. So what I started to do the next night that I was up, which was the next night, is um, at that time, I was looking at moving out of my chattering, upset mind into my body. So that's what I would do. I would uh, run energy in my body. I would uh, feel the feelings in my stomach instead of the thoughts that were rambling in my head. And what mm -hmm. I found was that moved me into a place of deep rest. And the next day when I, cause, because normally I'd sleep, I'd wake and sleep. So this, this night I sleep, I slope, slept, I wake, woke. Whoa, English is not working for me very well right <laughs> now. I slept, I woke. I did some of this personal growth stuff, moved into deep rest, fell back asleep, and the next morning I had energy. So that was the beginning of understanding about what deep rest was, what were the obstacles, how to move through the obstacles. And um, that's how the program started. Wow. So you just found this almost like just this magic solution well it's not a magic solution I'm sure that it's not that but it, I bet it felt like magic at the time it's you know it it's opened up so many doors because insomnia feels like a trap it feels like you have three options you can suffer in bed and hope that the magic of sleep descends on you as a, a gift mm -hmm. you can get up and do something or if you do cognitive behavioral therapy you get up and read but you know you try to do something or you take a remedy or medications. And if you can't sleep and those three options don't work, it's like you just feel stuck. So this helped me understand that sleep is not a thing to get, it's a process. That deep rest um, is part of that process and it renews, it helped me think better and I've done research on it. It helps the mental, emotional, physical, everything, the health mm -hmm. of your body. Um, and so it helped me shift out of that desperation I was feeling when I couldn't sleep. Mm. And so that felt like magic because mm. I had control. You know, I had I had the power. You can't make yourself sleep. Yeah. But I had the power to help myself rest. So I wasn't at the mercy of um, the fickleness of sleep. So there's a few things in there that um, have stayed with me. And the, the first one is that... So for you, is there a difference between sleep and deep rest? Like, sure. could so so could you talk about? I mean, can you have deep rest without sleep, or could you tell me about how you see those mm -hmm. working together or not? So deep rest is really the first step to sleep. A lot of people feel like they want to turn themselves off, like a computer. You know, they get in bed and go sleep. Yeah, you know? that's never happened uh, for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some people it does. Mm -hmm. um, and some people get frustrated when their body doesn't respond like that, but your body has to let go of the day. And um, little by little, even as you get ready for bed, you start to move into a restful state. And in order to fall asleep, you need to move into deep rest. It's a different alpha wave than, I mean, excuse me, different brain wave than it is for um, sleep. And I love sleep. I adore sleep. But um but when you can't get it, you you can't sort of force your brain to go into that sleep, sleeping space. Mm -hmm. And deep rest allows healing, renewing, and welcome sleep. Okay. So I'm just noticing that when you say deep rest and start talking about it, my body responds. Like, so I know. So my at the back, my spine feels like it's opening up and it's like Ooh. there's a part of me that wants to pay attention to what you said. And I'd be really interested in listeners because we've got a free Facebook group where they might want to come and chat later on about it. But does anybody else's body respond when they hear that difference between deep rest and sleep? I'd be really interested because this audience is full of empaths, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that'd be really interesting. 
Okay, and so um, so sleep is not something to get, it's a process. So that feels like that, I mean, that's, that's huge, like a, a huge reframe. And so it feels like it's something that we can journey into. Yes. And so that might take us longer sometimes than others, and that's okay. Well, it's an interesting thing, taking you longer. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a whole interesting thing because we live in such a crazy world. Um, and despite, um, I mean, even at the base of it, just with all the things we expect ourselves to do, all the electronics that take our attention, um, the fact that we live in little small family units, um, we're running like crazy. So mm. sleep is something we have to get. We have to get our hours. Um, and so does it take longer? Well, it, it, when I can't sleep, if I move into rest, sleep does come more quickly, but I'm not watching the clock, counting the hours, waiting for it to come. So it's a so, different relationship. Yeah, yeah. So is there some kind of process that you could describe about that, like journeying into rest? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So what I've developed is seven aspects or seven pathways to rest. And there are different avenues that you can take to lead to a similar place. But mm -hmm. one of them is your relationship with your environment. So, um, you know, some of it is really important to have a space that you can create that feels like a cocoon, that is quiet, that is uh, lower temperature, that, um, you know, feels all cuddly, if you can. But you can't always control your environment. So the mm. other piece is, what is your relationship to your environment? Um, that's that's one key piece because I know of people who just um, not only get upset about being interrupted, but they get um, infuriated. Um, you know, for me, when I get infuriated, a lot of times it reminds me of the fact that my mother paid no attention to me. So there's a voice in my head. It's like, how can you not pay attention to me? And that escalates, you know, the response. So part of it, again, is your response to whatever happens in your environment. Hmm. That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the second one is your relationship to your body, because we often feel like our bodies are our servants and ca to carry our minds around with. And we sort of do the minimum they require <laughs> to keep us going. <laughs> But when you sink into your body, when you change from thinking about your body to being aware of it, your body lets go and it's another pathway to move into rest. So a third one is um, your relationship to your mind because um, the conscious mind, I am so grateful I have a conscious mind. I've known people who you know, have dementia and have lost their conscious mind and it's a very sad thing. And the conscious mind is not the ruler of the world. But oftentimes the conscious mind is kind of narcissistic, you know, especially in this culture where it's like that's the only framework by which to judge what goes on. So when your mind is going crazy and talking to you, um, it's also saying underneath you have to listen to me, but you don't. So mm. some of it is having your relationship to the conscious mind of honoring it, but knowing that you can um, redirect it or change their focus so that it's not um, taking charge um, and remind the conscious mind that there are other ways of knowing it doesn't, there are other ways of planning. There's other ways of feeling relaxed other than the demands it's giving you in the middle of the night, they feel like demands. Mm -hmm. So we have the environment, the body and the mind, and then the relationship with emotions um, because emotions are really a subjective truth. Um, and we feel like whatever's coming up for me, us emotionally is true because we have a physical response to it. Um, and so I think it's really hard sometimes to separate, I don't know, a physical response to a speeding car and a physical response to the idea that um, uh, something bad is going to happen. You know, so we feel like both of those things are exactly the same, but they're not. And so I help people create space around emotions to relax anxiety enough so that there's moments of rest that build into minutes of rest that build into long periods of rest that build into sleep. So mm -hmm. again, it's your relationship to the 
subjective truth of emotions. Body. Okay. Envi emo environment, body, mind, emotions, um, a sense of bigger picture. Um, because we often feel isolated when we can't sleep. So again, mm -hmm. tapping into something bigger. Um, and then there's alignment with who you are, because if you feel out of alignment with your life, you can, um, you can move and do all the techniques to rest, but something underneath is not, you, you don't have the foundation to stand in the world the way you want to, to really rest into who you are. So that's the other one that we work on. Okay. So that, um, I like the idea that there are different routes in because that makes me feel like I've got a lot more choices and a lot more control. And I think what I'm hearing is a, a lot of it is about taking that observer role as well, rather than getting lost in, this is the truth, this is what's happening. So I think my description is like, I think the way that I would describe it is like that two o'clock in the morning thing. I was so grateful when I first came across this idea of, of like a while ago, not to pay attention to those, any thoughts that you have between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., just don't pay attention <laughs> to them. Like they are the loudest, they scream the loudest, they come up with the worst case scenarios, they feel so true and they're not. And I, I was just, thank God somebody's talking about this because I yeah. thought I was the only one, you know, and, um, and I think there's different parts that come up, you know, like, um, I don't know if you would see it similar to this, but I guess like my inner child or my inner critic, they're the ones that are going to try and get my attention when I am slow down enough out of the day, anything that's not been attended to is going to get louder as my day gets quieter. Right. Because yeah. you don't have the distractions. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, I, I need to back up. I forgot one of the pathways. And the other is your relationship to sleep. And that's the first one. Because when you chase after sleep, it doesn't happen. Yeah. It's, it's literally, it's like chasing a scared cat. And when things get quiet and you don't have distractions, um, the things that you are, have, are unresolved do come up. Mm. Um, and the thing is that we often feel like we have to resolve them to be able to sleep. And what we need to do is we need to honor them, um, create some space around them and allow our unconscious mind to help us resolve them instead of um, spinning the conscious mind into trying to figure it out and make it all settled. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, two, there's two pieces of your work that really grabbed my attention around sleep. So all of it did, but two pieces in particular. And one was the one that you just mentioned, which is like changing your relationship to sleep. That That's really big on its own. And then the other is, this is my language. I can't remember the words you, you use. But if you're not living an authentic life, that's going to grab you in your sleep. So when you work with people... Um, What's the question? When you work with people, what what tends to be the biggest piece? Is it the relationship to sleep, or is it the authentic life, or does it even does it even is there even a competition around it? I'm just curious what the main experience is. If you're not living an authentic life, if you're not feeling in alignment, it's going to show up somewhere. Mm. I mean, that's how you know, right? Uh, it can show up in your job and you hate Mondays and you hate Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. And finally, Fridays, you feel like, ah, you got some moment. So it shows up there. If you don't know what you want to do um, and you worry about it so much, oftentimes it shows up in sleep. So that's a place where um, it's a pathway to explore all of those, all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, how... You, you need sleep to renew. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't get along without it. So that's a place that no matter who comes to me, we always make sure that that piece is addressed so that you can know how to move into renewal. Does so that answer it, your question? Yeah, it, do, it does. And it leads me on to kind of that, that approach to sleep. Um, my, my big thing is like play. I try and bring play to not take things so seriously and I think sleep is an area where I am really rubbish at that like I don't think to bring play to, mm. to sleep um sleep is definitely a thing that I just need to do right exactly yeah. it's a thing yeah right as if you could get into the grocery store you would 
right? Yeah, I just need to <laughs> fill up so I can get right. on with things that I really enjoy doing, but I like right. feeling rested. Yeah. Um, so you've given me a lot of food for thought, but I, my question is, how would you, if I wanted to bring more fun or play to my sleep, how would you guide me in that? I would look at your evening ritual, what you do before you go to bed. I would um, have a, a bedtime stories, children's books next to your bed. Um, I would get uh, kids um, pillowcases um, to put on your pillows. Um, stuffed animals. I love stuffed animals um, in terms of just uh, uh, as transition objects, they just speak to my heart in ways that a regular pillow doesn't. Um, so I, I, I bring them out on special occasions because having them there all the time sort of diminishes their capacity. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, jump on the bed, you know, in the morning when you get up, you know, it's like, you know, just 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 make the bed, um, you know, a place to, a place for play. Um, and I know people hear about this all the time, but um, take your electronics away from the bed as much as possible. Um, because it's not just the blue light issue, because the blue light can uh, keep your melatonin from pumping out. But um, electronics, I, electronics just stimulate the conscious mind. You know, it's it's it it it's stimulating them in like small doses. It's making it engaged and amused and entertained. But it's really keeping you from moving into that playful where play comes from, which is your unconscious way of seeing the world. Mm. So, you know, just letting ha yourself have a break from that and just seeing what arises. Draw a picture before you go to bed. Draw a picture mm. of what you want to dream of. Mm. I like the idea of um, of creating ritual that feels that feels lovely, and I I, I have like um I have a shamanic ritual that I do at the end of the day, but that I can see now that that is a daytime. It's okay. the thing that I do to close off the day, but I don't think I do anything to open up the night, which is interesting. So in terms of I'm wondering if there's any other examples you've got from your client work of different kinds of like nighttime rituals that might for listeners that they might give them, you know, ideas of examples. Yeah. Candles are wonderful. Just the color, mm -hmm. the light, if it feels safe. Um, lavender, um, you know, just uh, spraying some lavender oil. Um, there is uh, remaking the bed um, or making sure the bed is made up for you before you go to bed. Um, and even even when you st when you start to go to bed, um, turning off the lights in the house early so that your body starts to remember that it's dusk. Um, there is a piece about um, you know there there's just even just having a ritual of honoring the night, you know, just welcoming, letting go. Um, so those those are some things that you know can start people's connections to, and you know just connecting to your body just doing mm. a body scan of just just appreciating the miracle that we are living in you know the bod body is an amazing creation that we happen to be um, caring for and caring for us that's lovely that's lovely and I like the it, the phrase that's coming to my mind when I'm listening to you is treat sleep as special like that that sleep is a special thing that that whole thing of it like it's not just something to get done mm -hmm. but sleep is special and um rewarding and the I want to back up way way back up but it's staying with me from something that you said at the beginning of the interview when you talked about running energy through your body I think that most listeners will know what that means but can you just say what you mean by that yep that's a good point um, it's something I learned years ago, um, which is to um, get grounded, you know, feel your feet on the floor. Um, if you know chakras, sort of the different energy centers of imagining the first chakra, which is down um, by your genitals, by your pelvic, pelvic area, and imagine that there is a connection from that first chakra to the center of the earth. It could be a tree root. It could be a beam of energy connecting to the earth it could be light it could be a sound wave so that you feel yourself um 
part of this earth that really wants you here. There's a place for you. The <laughs> earth is holding you. Mm. And then feeling that earth energy coming up through your feet um, and back down that that um, cord that goes into the earth. So that's one loop. And then you um, imagine that sense of spiritual or cosmic energy entering through your head, running down the... Um, two sides of your spine and down into the center of the earth and where it mixes at the first chakra it goes up through your body and out into your aura so mm -hmm. those are just um, different ways that the energy can cycle um, and you can use it as the energy passes through to see where there's tension in your body and allow that to release even just five percent again we in terms of process we often think we have to be completely relaxed to let go but just a little bit of relaxation starts that sense of um, shift that we yeah. have, the letting go. Yeah. You are giving me lots of good quotables, <laughs> <laughs> the way that you describe things. So I don't know if you venture into working with kids or teens. Um, so I know that a lot of our listeners have children that are sensitive, that are on the autistic pathway. Um, and that have huge issues with sleep. Um, and I know, you know, some of the advice about n no blue lights, no stimulation, lots of downtime, running the body out, like exhausting their body during mm -hmm. the day, stimulating them. None of that works for one of mine. <laughs> and um, it's something that we are navigating and finding different choices for her and un unusual things seem to work um but have you come across kids where this normal the stuff about no blue lights and all that kind of just doesn't seem to do it just you know no one thing is ever going to do it and no one thing is i mean sleep is different every night insomnia is different even if you have insomnia over and over again it's different every night um, there's mm -hmm. something that's subtle. I have, for each of those pathways, I have tools. And, you know, I have my favorite tool. And if I get insomnia and that tool doesn't work, you have to pu you pull on another one. So there's yeah. no guarantees. Yeah. But one of the things that really occurs to me from um, having a late husband who was on the spectrum and um, is, is the relationship to the conscious mind. Um, that, mm. um, that there is... Um, that oftentimes the conscious mind can really start spinning. Um, and that makes it, uh, it, it can just run the body, you know? Yeah. So I think that it's an interesting thing to look at um, what the relationship is to the mind. Um, and uh, one possibility um, that can work and has worked for me for a while is to um, make the conscious mind do illogical things. So again, you're sort of getting it out of its pathway of, of, of logic and fixing things. So imagining uh, a garden and a fence, which is connected, and then imagining um, a sports car or imagining, you, you can, you know, um, and imagining something that's just really far away from what you can, what you're thinking of. So a sports car to, um, uh, to your left sh uh, uh, shoelace, to your um, uh, to antihistamines in the grocery store. So what you're doing is you're starting to break up the logical patterns that the mind is going in. That's just one example. Where mm. you can you, you can have the person imagine doing yoga. Um, you know. Um, so again, it's just to try to change that relationship where the mind is not in charge so, so that attention can go to other areas. Okay. So I, yeah, and I love what you say about getting the person to imagine that they're doing something like yoga. So like when I think um, about using some kind of visualization or something like that that takes me or my kids away from that fixed state that you're talking about which is quite un quite often anxiety based then to go off into like a dreamy state that's it's too far removed from where you are 
But that that you're talking about is a really useful bridge because it's still allowing your mind to be quite active, which is where it naturally wants to go. It doesn't want it. You can't go into the deep no. relaxation or anything. It's not safe. It's not safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's an, also an interesting thing to find an area of the body that feels safe. So with anxiety for me, you know, my whole core goes crazy, but especially my stomach. And mm -hmm. there usually is just some spot, usually like yeah. right here, you know, where it's a, it's a safe spot. And you can imagine it growing if it feels safe growing. But if not, you can just sort of imagine the color and sort of really sense what that's like. And still um, uh, allowing the sympathetic nervous system, which is going crazy, to do its thing and not try to get it to stop because right then if it's in fight or flight, it's going to go into fight, you know? So yeah. if you force your sympathetic nervous system to chill out already, it's like, forget it. Mm -hmm. I ain't doing that. Yeah. It's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that really goes with my awareness around um, trauma resolution and working with the nervous system is like, it speaks so like your body speaks so loudly when you've yeah. got stored trauma, it's just so busy. Yeah. so busy so noisy and it feels like there are no safe spaces in your body but quite often there are you know and I think that is really really useful for people to hear it's just so finding one even if it's like I've been the way that I've been educated is even if it's the tip of your thumb or your toe you know or your earlobe or something there will be a place that feels okay for you to direct your attention to and honoring that if there's not there is a safe spot in the room. You know, you can imagine, you know, again, we're bringing in play here. Um, I love fairies. I love uh, uh, superheroes. I love other resources. And that they can sit, you know, you, you can imagine somebody sitting in the corner of the room with you and having another resource where it's safe. So it's, hmm. again, just honoring that the experience of total anxiety is not total. There is yes. a glimmer, yes. you know. Somewhere. And that's the, yes, and that's the beginning, and it starts to open up, doesn't it? Or, or it might not, but it, but it open. But that's that's where I come to when working with people with anxiety is opening enough enough space to have a nanosecond of rest, because yeah. each nanosecond that you can return to starts to move your body's attention away from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system needs conscious attention when you're anxious and it's very hard to shift gears. So when you can shift gear, gears for a second, it starts to create that pathway where you can move back, back, and mm. finally sit into that place where you can rest. And then maybe you're anxious, but then, you know, sort of you can just become more and more acquainted with that place of rest. And a nanosecond is great. Yeah. I mean, but, I think that that's the other thing that happens when people are, are anxious is that um, they hate that feeling so much that the only okayness is when all of that anxiety goes away. Yeah. Um, and that that's sometimes impossible. Um, mm -hmm. This happened for me the night after the U.S. election a couple of years ago, you know, it's just um, mm -hmm. and and so that reality is there, but I could still create spaces of rest. Um, and there's lots of tools that I've used to help help do that. Um, and then you can move into rest and you can move into sleep because you have to get up in the morning. Mm. So I feel like I've just scratched the surface with with you. And I just wondered if you would mind finishing on sharing a favorite client story that's appropriate to share that can kind of be a demonstration of the, some of the things that you're talking about or just anything that comes to, to mind, really. Um. You know, it's a story I've I've told before, but it's still one of my favorites. I had a client. Well, we've not who, did it. So. <laughs> that's true. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I had a client who um, had a lot of sleep issues and really thought that uh, sleep was supposed to be turning on and turning off, um, and couldn't. Just he hated the night and he couldn't he couldn't get himself to to rest and sleep. Um, and I asked him his hobbies because I talked to when I work with clients, I want to know, I want to know what they like to do during the day and bring those skills in. And he was embarrassed to admit that he liked Dungeons and Dragons. Um, because, you know, it was like, he liked it, but it wasn't okay. And I suggested that 
he imagined one of his D&D characters resting, not sleeping, but what he had some halfling giant or something, you know, it's like, well, how does this halfling giant go to bed? How do they create rest? And from that, he started to use his imagination to figure out other ways to rest. When he, when that halfling giant's ideas didn't work, he created another character and he could start to use those places to be able to understand that rest was possible for him. And that was a huge shift Mm. for him to be able to, um, uh, and it's not just feeling okay about not sleeping. It's also a matter of moving through the obstacles to move into that place of, of letting go and deep rest. And he was able to do that. And he was really fun to work with. Wow. A great sense of humor. Yeah. So that is like, it's liberating. I think the way that your work approaches sleep and, um, really creative, um, so I love that story. And if if people are if people are hearing things and they're thinking that they want to know more, where's the best place that they can find you um, on the Internet or where do you hang out? My Internet site is restfulinsomnia.com. Um, I have a Facebook page, the same one. Okay. Um, and they can there's contact ways for that. I do do free consultations, assessments for people. Okay. Um, and, and give them a sense of um, where they are in terms of uh, their, their sleep issues. And, well, they probably know where they are in their sleep issues, but sort of the perspective of how they can shift some of those things, um, sleep issues and alignment. And um, I am planning to uh, start a group in the fall as well as personal coaching. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll put links to um, your website and your Facebook page in the show notes and you also have some books right I'm just mm-hmm. thinking that people might can you just tell us a little bit about those if yeah, people might I had, be interested I had the pleasure of writing four books um one uh, one was on personal energy boosting a couple on brain function and then I also wrote one on restful insomnia so that was oh. that came out about 10 years ago and those are also listed on my site you can buy them through there Okay, I think that's really useful for people to know. So I'm going to put you on the spot. So the final question is, in all of that that we've talked about, if you were to just give one piece of advice or say one thing that you wanted to about this whole area in one sentence, what would that be? You are putting me on the spot. Let's see. I am. All right, so one sentence I would say about this whole area. Um. You know, instead of struggling to get someplace, you can rest into who you are and that that has an incredible amount of power. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. um, That's it. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. You know, I wanted to add one more thing um, about uh, resources because people can also sign up for my newsletter um, Mm -hmm. and I share tips and help um, about sleep and life. Um, in that as well. So that's also on the, on the, uh, okay. uh, Thank you. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining us and take care and see you soon. Yes. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, you're welcome. Quickly before you go, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And I wanted to let you know that I have got some slots available in my mentorship program. And in case you don't know, currently my mentorship programs are aimed at professional healers, channels, skilled helpers, coaches, therapists who really want to live their sole purpose with clarity, confidence and joy, but are kind of feeling stalled in this more authentic way of working. Because let's face it, who guides the guides, right? Who mentors the mentors? And I wanted to offer something that combined my abilities to channel the ancients. So obviously, you know, you work, the three of us working together, it'd be me, you and the ancients, um, to combine that wider perspective with my own past experience as training counsellors and supervising counsellors with my own experience of being a professional channel for the last seven or eight years. So there's like added layers for us because this is not a career path that you're told about at um, at school. It's 
something that kind of happens to us the more that we lean into radical self-acceptance this kind of like your pathway kind of emerges purpose sorry kind of emerges from within when you stop seeing your natural self as being wrong in some way so I always joke that channeling is an ancient profession, an ancient profession whose times come again. And I think a lot of us are on this pathway of really bringing ancient messages, ancient traditions, ancient professions back into a more modern way of presenting so that they can appeal to the mainstream. And when we feel like, you know, we've been told we're too much and too sensitive and or too loud or too this or too weird or whatever, we still can run into that wrong way of thinking that we're we kind of still trying to fit in and we don't belong here by fitting into systems of reality that are broken. We belong here by helping each other create new ways and new ways of being and that's what your purpose will be as well it'll be you know your your purpose will be to heal but it'll be to heal or help or support people in a completely new way and so that really can add this layer of complexity to ideas that we're not good enough or that we don't belong we don't fit in and that can get in the way of our confidence and our clarity um and so that's what I really want to focus on. If that any of that is resonating with you, pop over to carawild.com, have a look on the Work With Me page or email me at carawild.com and let's have a chat and see whether I can support you in um, your next steps on living your sole purpose. And let's see where we go from there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye.